913 WVKR. Just heard Rufus Wainwright. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the Local Motion on 913 WVKR YouTube channel, as well as giving a like on the Facebook page by the same name. Today, Jeff Hill is my guest. We're going to do a brief introduction and then we're going to talk. Bassist, producer, engineer Jeff Hill has performed and or recorded with countless musicians, including Bruce Springsteen, Larry Campbell and Teresa Williams, Joan Baez, Marco Benevento, Rufus Wainwright, just to name a few. He was part of the Chris Robinson Brotherhood Band from 2016 to 2019. He's now part of Steve Earle's band and a member of the Dukes. Welcome, a warm welcome to Local Motion, Jeff Hill. Thanks, Rita. Yeah. Um, I think one of the first times I saw you play was when you were playing with Larry and Teresa. Yeah. And going up to Larry after the show, I'm like, man, this bass player is like amazing because I hadn't seen you before. He's like, Rita, let me tell you something. He's like, what's that? He's like, one of the best bass players I've ever played with is Jeff Hill. Wow. I didn't know he's... That's, that's very, See, I wanted to surprise and tell you that. On air, but that came from Larry. Um, Thanks, Larry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and I noticed it too because I was like, "Wow, who is this guy?" So, your first instrument didn't seem to be a bass; it was an alto clarinet. Yeah, it was clarinet first, and then then I switched to alto clarinet. How I kept old? moving lower and lower. I <laughs> I, I like the low notes. The yeah. low notes. <laughs> um, what age was the clarinet? The clarinet was nine. Uh huh. Yeah. So and that I typical third, chorus. fourth grade. Yeah, music school. I mean, music programs. Where'd you, know? you grow up? So this was. Um, well, I was born in, in Passaic, New Jersey. I lived there for till I was nine or ten, and then I moved to Suffern, New York, mm-hmm. which is very close close by. Yeah. And then when I I went to high school in Connecticut, I'm a tri-state kid. I just kept moving around the yeah the tri-state. Yeah. So I, and I ended up on on the Massachusetts Connecticut border for high school. Nice. I don't know if you know where the little notch in Connecticut Yeah, is. absolutely. It was about 150 yards from that notch. Yeah. It's so wild because you, when you're there, you can be in New York in a few minutes, Massachusetts, yeah. and then Connecticut. It's like- I spent a lot of time in Ma- in, in central Mass mm-hmm. as a, growing up. So Yeah. Musical family? Um, well, my grandparents, my, my grandfather, my, grand, my mom's parents are from Puerto Rico, and they would sing and play guitar all the time. They mostly uh, songs about Jesus uh-huh. uh, in Spanish. Very, yeah, and my grandfather used to like he he would always play the guitar, a nylon a Spanish guitar, and then he'd hand it to me, and just say you play, and I'd have to like try to copy what he was doing, and I kind of always it was a nylon string guitar, so I always kind of gravitated to the low notes. I love that. I love the way those the low, those low notes on the sounded. So I was a bass player right away. Like, right away, you just <laughs> had to. Was, Get through it a little bit to yeah, get there. So, and he was ear training me. He was just giving me playing chords and just giving me the guitar. So and your great grandfather was a tuba player. He was a tuba player, yes. And, I, and I, I'm not. Sh- I mean, there's no recordings, so I don't know what. I mean, right. It was in Puerto Rico, so I imagine it was, it was Latin music. You know? Your parents came here to this. Well, my mom came in the 50s. Mm-hmm. My dad is from from here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, and, uh huh. Yeah. And they got. To, there was kind of a West Side Story. Oh, situation. nice! They weren't supposed to be together, and they yeah. they snuck around and and uh, and just, <laughs> what a love story! Married. Yeah, yeah. It's a love story for sure. Yeah, yeah. they're still married, and that's well, beautiful. Yeah. Wow, how many years? Uh, I don't know exactly. I know it's getting up there. Right. It's probably my dad just turned eighty, so it's probably in in the sixty. Wow. Around maybe fifty six. I don't know how people do that. God bless them. God, you know, it's an amazing yeah. thing. It's such a beautiful thing when you hear a love story like that. Your parents still close by? They live in the same house. Oh, really? Yeah. Where in, you grew up in, in Suffern? No, this is oh, in, in uh, North Granby, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So awesome. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So you started playing. And then I understand you also play a little cello. I played cello. That was uh, something that happened much later. Mm-hmm. When I was in New York, I bought a cello at a, at a stoop sale. Uh-huh. And then I just started playing. Bringing it's got it everywhere. strings. What the heck? I can <laughs> I do this. I bring it to every session because sometimes it, I end up, even when I'm just learning a song, I'll do it. Really? On instead of oh, like, how cool. Yeah. So you're just like, wow, yeah. nice. Electric bass at 12. Around 12, yeah. Why the bass? Because you just love that note. Well, what, what turned you on to it? Do we listening to something? I love the something? bass. I always, I always was hearing the bass notes, but I, something really important happened when I was around that age. I went to a, 
I went to a wedding, my cousin Richie's wedding in in, in uh, Pennsylvania, Richie Arachi. He had a, he had two two brothers and uh, David and Michael and his father Charlie, and they had a Beatles cover band. And so at the wedding, they played Beatles songs, and I was just completely blown away. I didn't know you. How could old do were that. you? I was around that. that I, I think I just started thinking about playing bass. Uh huh. Yeah. And that really t- when my cousin David played bass, and he showed me that song "Money" uh-huh. by Pink Floyd, and I was like, oh, and then it just kind of like I was like, okay, this is. This is this, what I'm doing. You, you could just, you know, get a couple of people together and play the songs. I was, right. I, 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 that that kind of just set me off right there. So you got your first electric bass. So, yes, I, I, I got Did you take lessons? I took lessons for a very short time. Um, and I was playing a, I didn't have money for a bass yet, so I had an acoustic guitar with four strings taken off, which was natural for me because that's what I was playing at my grandfather's. Right, and, right. And, um, and I wanted to learn the Lemon Song by by uh, by Led Zeppelin, and he kept saying, "You know, it's too. That's too hard. You can't do that." And then the very next week, I came in and I learned it. Wow, by and ear? Because there was yeah, was there internet then? No, n- no, no. That was, I just turned it, took it off of vinyl. Wow. And um, and then I didn't stay with that teacher very long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that, uh, later on, I had some some other lessons. Did you have in high school a little rock band or? I had a. I mostly played. Uh, in a, in a rock band I had with some older guys, so mm-hmm. I was I was about fifteen or fourteen, and the guys in my band were twenty two and twenty six. Wow! And so we were gigging. Wow. So I was gigging by the time I was fourteen. Wow! All around, you, you know, Western Mass, and and um, and then that band s- split up a few years later, and I pl- I joined a band with even older guys. <laughs> they were like in their in their forties and twenty twenty seven, playing like my. Neil Young songs and country songs. And, Holy crap! And so I was gigging like it never it never thought like why wouldn't I do music because I was making more money than right. Uh, you know, like I was making good money even as a, a teenager. So. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So no so, allowance for you. You go out and play. Yeah, I was going out. Yeah. I was I had a mustache so I could go to bars. Right, you looked a little <laughs> bit older, and back then was it was what, a different thing. Like if you had, yeah, you, was, you know, it it's not like it is a little bit today with like the whole. 21 thing um yeah. you look we're listening to ozzy and a little bit of rock and roll zeppelin yeah, to, to definitely for zeppelin and yeah and zz top a lot of yeah yeah yep. when did yeah. jazz come into your world so i i played in the jazz band at school and we kept going to berkeley for the for there was a big every every year there'd be a high school big band competition and we go there so and and i had an older there was a um, one of the guys I played with a lot is named a guy named Bruce Arkin, who was a saxophone player, and he went to he went to Berkeley before I did, and he would come back and be like, "Hey, you know, you gotta check out Coltrane, you gotta check out you know, Michael Brecker, and these all these people." And he was like turning me on to stuff, and so at that point, I started taking lessons with a, a great bass player named Dave Santoro uh, at Hartford Conservatory, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he also had a, a school. That Tony Leone went to actually uh-huh. music, perf- uh huh music music uh, performance, performance school Hartford yes. Academy of Performing Arts yes yes, Arts. yes. He, I got accepted to the college I mean to the school but my there was already a kid from my school going there mm-hmm. so they wouldn't pay for me to go so oh uh, so gotcha we, we didn't have the didn't money, go probably, didn't right go. but uh, it's funny because if I had gone I would have met Tony Leone when I was. 18 or something. I was like 16 or something. Right, yeah. right. And we didn't meet until... Years later. later. Yeah. But now it's like, what a great story that one is too. Um, you did go to college. I did go to college, yeah. Right. So the, part of that, part of those high school performances, they would give, they would hand out scholarships. Mm-hmm. So there, there was scholarship money, so I, that helped me go when I first got, got there. So I went to Berkeley in 88. That's great. And there was, you know... It was crazy the amount of people that were were there at that time. Like, like who? I mean, Roy Hargrove was there, Alfam Marsalis, Jeff Keezer, uh, Adam Dorn, Matt Garrison, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Dwayne Berno. All these, you know, go, it goes on and on. It was like a, the kind of the young lions of wow. You know, it was it was pretty it was pretty cool. Back, yeah. at that time. You know? Yeah, yeah, man, man, oh man, Kurt Rosenwinkel blows me away. That guy just. Like, I have a really funny story, but oh please about tell that, us because I. My very first day at Berkeley, I was staying in, on the seventh floor dorm, and 
we they you know they had a meeting and they get they told us like an right, RA meeting RA or something. meeting where yeah. like you know you can't do you can't smoke you can't drink whatever whatever the the you can't the do rules this. are you, you can do and we're all sitting there and everybody's kind of pretty bored and at the end of the meeting this little scrawny skinny kid at the end just you know speaks up and he's like who wants to play some funk <laughs> and like everybody that kind of looks at him and no one says anything and I was like I just raised my hand I was like all right. <laughs> So we we went down into a room, like they have these re- rehearsal rooms, and like and they have these, they had these old Yamaha amps with these orange lights, and he turns off the lights, and we just like played free for an hour. Wow! And that <laughs> was like, Kurt. That was Kurt. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was amazing. He was already like he could play like every instrument. Yeah. Like it's so great already at that point. Yeah, yeah, just I had him on the show, and he was just like talking to him, listening to him. He's just a whole other realm. I recently saw him at Bearsville Theater with John Schofield, oh, yeah, yeah. Bill Frizzell. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm bad. I'm missing somebody. Him and I'll, I'll think of it, but just, yeah, he's amazing. He's unbelievable. Phenomenal. And then did you graduate from Berkeley or? I actually did graduate. I kept, you know, I, I by the end I was getting like a free ride. Mm-hmm. So I was like, kept my, it was my way of like, staying and keeping an apartment <laughs> yeah it was going yeah. to school yeah so i at, and at the at that point uh the head of uh the base department called me in and said hey there's this there's this college in in illinois that mm-hmm. wants to that needs a ta and uh we recommended you to, to do this and it was basically you had to teach like 12 hours of jazz ensembles a week and then you it was it was a lot of work you had to, and then you had to play in their touring big band Wow. So, which which was incredible. And so I drove out there. I put everything in my car. And I drove out. And I at that, that point, there was no internet. So you couldn't just, like, look things up. Right. They had, like, a pamphlet. And they had, and I had a map. And, <laughs> Good old-fashioned map. It was, in, it was in DeKalb, Illinois. And I looked at the map. And it's, and it was, and it looked kind of close to Chicago. I was like, oh, this is cool. And I get, I drive out there in my old Mercury Sable or whatever. I don't know what it was. But, it, and, uh, and. I drive past Chicago and I keep going <laughs> and I'm driving and, and like another 60 miles later, I'm in a cornfield basically as far as you it's the flattest place I've ever seen. Wow. As far as you could see, there's nothing but corn. Right. And I don't see a town, but I see a <laughs> sign that says DeKalb one mile and there's nothing. <laughs> I don't see like, anything. What? And then like I get up to the exit and there's just one building that you could see. It was like a, a clock tower type building. And then you're there. I was at Northern Illinois university. Wow. And I, uh, and so I get there and I, and it was this really great big band. Mm-hmm. Everybody, I mean, the p- players were incredible and, and, uh, um, and we would play with like, you know, we, we ended up, that year we ended up touring with Tito Puente. Oh, wow. We toured, we, we did a, a week at the jazz showcase with Clark Terry. Jeez. We played with Marvin Stam, Jim Pugh, all these guys. It was incredible. Wow. And so at that point, like, um. The, because I was the TA, that was like an older bass player. Like a lot of times, people would look, call the university for people to find a bass player for gigs. Right. So I would ended up going to Chicago maybe three or four times a week. And I was playing with the Rob Rob Parton Jazz Tech Orchestra and the Jazz Members Orchestra. So I was doing a lot of big band stuff. And and after a year of that, I of driving three days a week, I was like, you know, what? I'm just gonna end school. I'm gonna go to Chicago. Move to Chicago. So that's when did uh, stand up? Bass, come. stand-up bass ended. Up, it started pretty early. I, when I was in high school, my my uh, my principal of my high school uh, called me into her office and she said, "There's there's this really well-known bass player that lives in our town, and his and it turned out it was Gary Carr. I don't know if you ever heard of Gary Carr. I don't He's think like so. one of the 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 uh, most famous uh, uh, classical solo double bassist in the world." Um, he's, and he lived in our town. So I, you know, I met up with him and he actually, he was, he, I, I brought him the bass that we had at school. It was like an old K bass. And I brought it to him to, to look at the bass and he, he looked at it and he's like, he's like, you know, take the strings off now. Like as, as soon as he saw, he's like, there was no sound post in the bass. Okay. And I always wondered why the bass sounded so t- terrible. So he's like there, strings off. There was a, he's like, take them off. You can't, that, you can't play this bass. It's, it was about to collapse, you know? So 
he hooked me up with a bass and a teacher at Heart School of Music. Yep. To a grad student to uh-huh. to teach me how to bow. Right. Wow. And, wow. And so I didn't. I played it for a while. I didn't really play it that seriously yep. at that time, but I did learn a lot. Yeah. Yep. And then later, when I was at at, at college, I. I bought a base. Right. And I, got into it a little bit more seriously. It. Now, I understand in Chicago, you played every Saturday at the Green Mill. Uh, yes, from 12.30 a.m. to 5 a.m. Yeah, That's what, like last um, call, 5 a.m., or did they just not close? Uh, no, they, it was, they closed at 5 a.m. Yeah. yeah. And wow. then we'd go out to breakfast. We were up all night. Right, you know? right, right. I, I, that was back when I was I was in my twenties. So yes, I could, I yeah, could do that. yeah. It's a little bit different, pre kids and all of that yeah. stuff. Chicago yeah. was great at that at that time. There was, there was so many great players and, and there was so many gigs. A lot going on. Yeah, a I was lot playing going at the Bob on. Shop. I, I had I played a, the jam session at the Bob Shop with Lynn Holiday as well. Mm-hmm. And so I really just got to learn hundreds of tunes and. And just all kinds play of stuff. All the time. And yeah. this group, I love the name Sabretooth Jazz yeah. Quartet. Yes, yes. That yeah. Was the band. Tell me about your first recording session. When was that? My first recording session? Um, well, outside of anytime, anywhere. Uh, um, we did a really. I was I was part of that group. I was uh, at the Green Mill. There was a, a drummer named Ted Sirota, and I played with him. He had a, he had he he got a, a deal on this record label called Name. N A I M. Okay. And we did a recording at the University of Chicago. It was with uh, Kevin Kaiser and Jeff Parker mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. myself and Ted. And we played all, we just did it around two mics. Wow. It was a stereo recording and they like kind of just positioned everybody. It was at a, a, a concert hall at the, at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. And we just, everybody, like I was standing a little closer so the bass would be louder and yep. the drums are for, you know, it was, it was kind of very interesting. Wow. It's, it's, you can still find it. It's probably out there. Somewhere. Really? Yeah. It's cool. It's fun to find older stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, how'd you get to New York? And I don't mean by airplane or car. Why did you come to New York? Well, I, I did come by airplane <laughs> originally. Right. Because well, you were able to fly a lot, I understand. You would yeah, just like went time, to different I, places. At that time, I was married to my, my wife at the time. I got married really, really young and... At the, at the time, my wife worked as a graphic artist for United Airlines, and so we could basically fly anywhere, like for oh my gosh, you know, like fifty bucks. And so I just I kind of like kept flying to different places <laughs> when she was working. Um, that maybe worked. that's why we're not together, right? Um, and uh, and then I I started flying to New York, mm-hmm. and after after about four visits to New York, I was like, uh, I think we I think we should move back east yeah you know? uh-huh also we just never had every all of our vacations were going back east mm-hmm. so you know it'd be nicer to see our family on weekends right <laughs> right instead of just yeah. having to fly all the time so you moved to new york 1996 96 yeah i moved to park slope uh-huh yeah and uh and that was uh it was just a lot going on in new york so i oh it still is and there it still, still is, is. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah absolutely and i lived there up until i mean I just moved right before, before the pandemic, like mm-hmm. 2017. Right, I moved upstate. Right, so you were you were there for quite some time, and then I understand you started working with um, a woman named Holly Palmer. Yes, Holly was a friend of mine from college. Um, we uh, we had actually done a like a resort gig once in Wisconsin years ago when we when we first met. That was in like 1999 or so, and since then, she had gotten a record deal with Reprise Records. Oh, nice! And she was touring, and I uh, I auditioned and got the gig, and and we uh, started touring. We were opening up for for Paula Cole. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, quite a few tours. Wow! Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, was, that's really cool. And then you moved on to Rufus. So then I I auditioned for Rufus's band, and that was uh, with, and that was on his first tour, like on his first record. So. It was uh, that was with Kevin Hupp. And how did you Jack know? I, I love the stories of like, how did you know to audition for him? How did you hear about Actually, it? You know, do you know Andy Hess? Have you heard yes. Of him? Andy recommended me. They needed someone that played upright bass, electric bass, and sang. Mm-hmm. And Andy was like, "Well, I know a guy," and he told you know he he recommended me, which I'm forever grateful. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and, and you were with Rufus for a while for ten years. Ten so. years played yeah. on four records. Four records, yes. Right. Wow, and toured everywhere. And toured everywhere. Constant touring, yeah. 
over the war international or um well most of the touring was actually in europe and the uk because he as as he did well in the united states but he was a kind of a big thing and over the there UK, yeah. isn't it weird like the music the in Europe, the music, and sometimes here, and what's big there is not big here, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a whole thing. Like we go every every thirty miles, there'd be another opera house that he could play. It was it was you know like, it's you know, just like that. There's you know you go thirty miles and there's a different accent. In, yeah. in the UK, there's yeah. there's just like a whole group of people that love music too. That so. love music over there. Yeah, yeah. Have there have any venues that you've played at whether in the, this country or Europe that really just like oh, I love that venue I just um, yeah. want to play there again and just yeah like the Hammersmith Apollo in London was quite amazing and um, I, I play, we played there was a really cool place we played the Eden Project in Cornwall okay. which I thought was really cool uh huh yeah, it was, that was a, a, it's just beautiful down there right right um um, you know, of course, the Paradiso and yes. places like Amsterdam. Like yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. It's it's a beautiful place. Um, and when you were, from what I understand, you tell me when you weren't touring with Rufus, you started working with Shannon McNally. Yes. So that was so. Uh, Gary Waldman was uh, kind of recruiting people to play to play with uh, with with Shannon because she had just put a record out and was touring mm -hmm. a lot. And we, and he had just started working with Robert Randolph and the family band. Mm -hmm. And so that first tour, he was, wow. I, I was at their maybe f second gig they've ever played. And they, she basically, he put us together with them. We toured on their bus and, and it was incredible. That is. And wow. so then um, after that happened, we toured for about a year and that's when I first met Neil Casal, and that's and that created a whole, you know, worlds because a he, brotherhood, yeah, real brotherhood. Because we, uh, at the end of that tour, Gary said, "Hey guys, you know, there's Robert's got like a two month tour in October, and that gig was ending, and he's like, why don't you guys just like put some music together and like do the, and and you know, tour with Robert." And so we were all kind of like, oh, but in the meantime, we had always been joking around about this fictitious band called Hazy Malaise. <laughs> I love this. Um, Go ahead. This is great. Yeah, because yeah. our, our Shannon's brother one day was in the back of the bus and she's like, man, he's like, oh, man, I'm in a real Hazy Malaise. <laughs> and we thought it was the funniest name. So we were like, what? That's a bad name. And so we, so we, uh, we kept talking about this band that we were going to make, and, and, but we, we, did, we weren't really serious about it. And then Gary said, hey, you know, start – this band so we got together at dan's mom's basement dan fadel the drummer in in um in denville uh in denville new jersey which is crazy because dan grew up in denville i grew up in lake parsippany which is literally like three miles from there wow and neil grew up in in denville and uh like we grew up so close to so each close, other but never knew each other right and so then we're in the basement of his uh, of dan's mom's house <laughs> writing yeah. songs and we took and in and, and like i think the whole record took us like 13 days man we we wrote the songs and we we went out to the village recorder in la and we we recorded them with eric seraphin great producer oh. and uh hazy malaise and it, yeah. what was the name of that record that it's just hazy malaise just title yeah. track it and was... it's not even released in the united states we only released it in france really in, in europe on the fargo label uh-huh but i think that's about to change i think we're we're gonna release re-release all three records. Good for you. In the next couple, couple um, part of the Neil Casal Music Foundation, which um, is, I'd like to talk about that foundation. Yeah. Um, there's a beautiful album that many people got together and mm -hmm. made. And tell me what this foundation is about. So the foundation, uh, first and foremost, it's about mental health because uh, Neil did take his own life, and. Um, so there's money goes to help with music cares and help people get help if they are in having mental health problems. And it also uh, uh, provides instruments to kids in, in elementary schools and, and, and middle schools in, throughout like New Jersey and, North, and Southern New York. He would have loved that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I think it's a beautiful 
Foundation. Tell me about how people can donate or look up more about that. What is there's a website? I think of it's yeah, music, uh, Neil Casal Music Foundation dot com not dot org. org yeah, for the nonprofit. Yeah, and uh, and you can go and donate, and there's there's the, you could buy the records, and there's all sorts. Uh, there's always new things happening. Happening, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gary's really taking it, uh, take taking the stewardship of it, and and created a, a beautiful thing. Yeah, in, in Neil's name. Yeah, and so many people. After he passed, I, I I was watching online the devastation and also the people that came together after it. You mm-hmm. could tell how loved Neil was. Yeah. He, he touched a lot of people and he he brought a lot of people together. Mm-hmm. He was, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real shame that he didn't know that at the yeah. time. Yeah. I wish he knew right. how, how much And again, the mental him. illness, it's something, yeah. you know, I, we all have to take a little better care of each other when we know these things. It's, yeah. it's something else. Um, and then of course, I mean, there's probably, you've recorded with so many people. I know also Chris Robinson Brotherhood, yep. 2016 to 2019 that yeah, with disbanded. Neil, with when Neil, Neil and Tony. Yeah. Right. With Neil and Tony. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love your cover page on your Facebook page. You guys look like brothers. It's oh, you, yeah. Tony and in, Neil yeah, yeah. together. Yeah. 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 You just look like brothers. It's like, yeah, yeah okay. These guys. Well, Tony and I look like, really look like brothers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Neil on there, too. Um, how did you get into CRB? Um, so their bass player had left the band. And you got a call from somebody that knew you, because that's always the way it works. Yeah, and both <laughs> Neil, both, I had already played, uh, toured with, and recorded with Shooter Jennings, with, with uh, Tony. That's when we first met. And um, and so they both recommended me uh Eventually, I went. There wasn't really an audition. It was. It was actually. I mean, this is one of the most nerve wracking things that ever happened to me. <laughs> I go out and I had learned all the music. We go out to Terrapin Crossroads mm-hmm. to Phil's Phil Lesh's uh, venue, and you know, I basically just rehearsed the songs. They just hired me for a gig in in Aspen, and we are yeah. So I I went there. We we rehearsed at Terrapin, and then we flew to Aspen. But during the re- during the rehearsal, Phil was at the board. With his headphones on, oh. just look, just like listening, closing his eyes, making to every note that we played, and so which is a bit nerve wracking to have Phil Lesh, yeah, you know, and you're the bassist <laughs> adjudicating your audition, and um, and then he <laughs> he comes up to the band and he he says, "This band sounds effing great, love it, don't mess it up, really and then he splits, love it, <laughs> so wow, that was, that was the the Phil." Wow, that's a good the blessing. Film, the film nod, you know. So I was like, "All right, cool." Yeah, that's a that's yeah. a pretty cool blessing. Yeah. Wow, wow. And so I joined the later uh, a, a month or so later. I, I joined for, joined the band. For, you know, now you were playing. I I was listening to another interview that you were talking on. Um, was there a band that you played a lot of dead songs in, or um, maybe the. I mean, maybe I, early I, on or something. Early on, I, I played some dead songs. I was never really a big deadhead. No, personally. huh? No, I was. I, I like the dead, but just like, yeah, just like the the big songs. I wasn't. I wasn't like following the band. No, have you? Wasn't you like have, Tony. <laughs> no, <laughs> did you go to a show? Ever been to a show? I never went to a show. Really? No. Wow! Wow! And Tony Leone. Tony Leone really liked the dead. Yeah. Really liked the dead. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, I did too. Yeah, it's yeah. oh my gosh! I can't believe you never went to a show. Yeah. Um, wow, that's cool. But you've seen Phil play now. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, I'd love to have him on the show too. Um, yeah, man, oh man. What really intrigued me also, your bass. What a story! Your 1951 Fender. Oh, the the the, the bass that I didn't even know what you were really buying. Yeah, I just I was at Mandolin Brothers. They're, I think they're closed now, but uh, probably because they made mistakes like this. <laughs> I, I went. My my friend Peter Salette, who I work with a lot, is, was was there buying wanted to buy a guitar, and I I, I decided to join him. But I was like not buying any right. instruments. No, no, you're just I was joining. Just him. going there to look, and so he was he he tried like every guitar, and so we were there for hours, and so I there was this bass on the wall, and just said no. It it looked like a Fender. It had no. It was like stripped. It didn't have a decal or anything, and there was no serial number on it, and it, and it was set up really weird and had these weird bakelite bridge. They were all grooved. 
It was like, it, it just, it was hard to play, but it had this kind of like great sound. I was like, I could tell there was something ma magical about it, but it, it wasn't quite there yet. Right. And I, you know, I kept going back to it and playing it. And it was, you know, he, they wanted like 2,600 bucks for it or something. They knew it was a fender of some sort, but they didn't have a zero number. And, and, um, and so I, uh, you know, I just, I decided I was going to get it. I was like, this is something, something's cool about this. I'm going to get it. And as we were, after I bought it, we were, you know, taking it some parts and I found the serial number and the serial number was zero one four five. Wow. We call it the blues bass because, because wow. <laughs> of the, the progression. And patent pending, right? Didn't it says it say patent pending on the bridge underneath the cover. And that's the first year that. It was, it was, I think it was like, they started production in, in November of 51 and this is December 51. Wow. So it's really like one of the. 145. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they were sequential, but right. the, but it was it was after it was like a month into production. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. how early is that? Um, you obviously still have this yes, base. Yes. This yes. was like your four hundred one k at this point. I, I do have the base. Yeah. <laughs> and you had another duplicate made because you were scared of taking this one on tour, yeah. right? Because yes. I mean, we all hear these horrible stories with musicians' instruments on tour. Yeah, I don't really take those instruments out. Yeah. Anymore, but. Um, so I did make a duplicate of it. It wasn't quite as good. Uh -huh. and, um, and what do I, you use now? Uh, now I I have a I use you know I've been using my Starfire bass kind of a fill fill bass, but uh, I have a Starfire. I I play a, a, a EBO. I play a, a, a 61 P bass, but I have a Mulan bass, which is kind of a P bass. Uh-huh. Copy that's how many bases that's do you have? I have quite a few. Uh-huh. <laughs> but they come and go sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trade or whatever, right? Yeah. 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 Um I also saw you with the great Steve Earle. Oh you did? I Wait, did. I think oh no. Was that at the nope. town hall? No. Nope. That was I didn't see you with Steve Earle. I saw that on video. I saw him solo at yeah. Bearsville. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Um but I want to see you with him because I've seen videos of you with him. But that's it. No, I didn't see you. Um, what a what a American icon that guy is. Yes, he's. I mean, what a songwriter. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, I know you guys have a show coming up in December. Um, but tell me about how you got connected with Steve Earle. Well, because you're a Duke. Yes. Yeah, so part that that happened. Um, that was it, it was kind of a combination of you know i had played at the i had played in the, in the ramble band mm -hmm. um just very shortly after neil passed away and he was the guest artist for the ramble band um and and then a couple of weeks later he sang at neil's memorial and then maybe two months later he could gave me a call because his bass player was was sick and he said i need somebody to come and play on a record at electric lady and also do the outlaw cruise and and um i had played with brad pemberton before who was in the cardinals with neil and we had toured uh, australia and did some uh, did some playing and and i had also played with the mastersons who uh were on shoot the, the two records i played with i played on with shooter jennings so i kind of knew most of the band and so they recommended me and steve had had just played with me so he was like oh okay well, that makes and they needed somebody from new york to play it upright so it kind of just found worked the place. and then that worked um, tragically the uh, kelly looney the uh, steve's bass player for 32 years uh ended up passing away of uh, uh. he um, i don't know I'm, I'm not sure what happened he had his wow uh, complications yeah oh oh and so yeah a lot of tra a lot, <laughs> lot of, of tragedy lot of tragedy. oh my god musicians yeah um and then you got the call, and yeah. So then I, I did the recording, and then at that point he's like, "Hey, you want to join the band?" And and, and now you do, and now you are, and now you're going all over the place with good old Steve Earle. Yeah, yeah what a great songwriter. He's recording something, dude. Didn't you? Or or there's something out already for his son Justin Towns. Yes. So we made we did a record of Justin songs mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, during the pandemic actually because mm -hmm. his son died during the pandemic right. um, and then we uh, did a show at the Ryman to honor we were supposed to do a show last December on his birthday on, on his 40th birthday and uh, there was a COVID outbreak 
so just before that so we ended up having to cancel that and we're doing it this january 4th nice at the um, ryman at the ryman yeah wow wow and, um, yeah yeah um and just on sale now, people here in New York, tri-state area, December 19th, I think it's a Monday night at Town Hall, so you can get in and out of the city pretty easy because it's yes. right by Grand Central. Mm -hmm. And um, Steve Earle and the Dukes, which you are, um, David Byrne, the Mastersons, Terry Allen, tell mm -hmm. me about the benefit that that show is. So that is a benefit for the Keswell School, which is a one-on-one a, a -on -one autism school there's one there's one teacher per, for every student it's for mostly uh nonverbal uh, you know, autistic kids, kids autistic kids yep and it's um and it's you know the, the, the best of the best that they can get so right where is that uh, school i'm not sure i think they just moved mm -hmm. they, they used to be like on 23rd street or something and now they moved somewhere i'm not sure exactly where it is right Right, right. Monday, December 19th. You can check out Steve Earle's website as well as um, the Town Hall website because I know I'm getting pre-sale info yeah. and all of that stuff happening already, um, which is so cool. So cool. That's going to be a great show. It's amazing. Um, somebody was telling me, who was it? Willie Nile? Somebody. Yeah, Steve Earle has a place down there. He lives right next to Patty Smith or something. They all like live down in the East Village. Oh, he lives right on Bleecker Street. For yeah, yeah, time, yeah, yeah. For, and they, they're like, yeah, they just kind of like hang out. Patty yeah. Smith is down there yeah, by and, design. I yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it just kind of all happened. He's moved since actually recently. He, he seems like a, a really cool guy and a great guy to play with. He's very charismatic. What a storyteller, which you can tell with his songwriting. It's yeah, like absolutely. pretty amazing. You guys have um, you're going on a cruise again. Yes, the Outlaw Cruise. The Outlaw, the Outlaw Cruise. West. I um, love that. I think it's in February. Yes. And you're going to Australia. Yes, I believe so. It's uh, on his website, so his yes, website. yes. Yeah, April, I think, 2023. Mark your calendar. Okay. <laughs> um, and you're coming in a few weeks. I, I think, yes, you're going um, into Los Angeles with Lucinda Williams. I'm not doing that. You're not that's doing solo, that. Yeah. Okay, that's just solo work. Yeah, I okay. think Australia might actually be solo as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you'll be in New York, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we also talked uh, briefly before we got on air. By the way, we're talking to Jeff Hill today. You're tuned into Local Motion here. I'm your host, Rita Ryan. Um, and Jeff, again, the first time I met you was with Larry Campbell. And I use his music, as you can tell from my mm -hmm. intro. Yeah. Um, Tell me about your connection with him and the Midnight Ramble and Levon and so Woodstock. It's all because of Byron Isaacs. Byron, uh, you know, we're, we, we've been friends for a long time. We don't really see each other that often because we're both bass players. So right, we, right. But we, You're but both on separate gigs. Yeah, mutual, high mutual respect. And, and uh, he's always... Uh, you know, sub things out to me that were, that were, that were great. So he's, he, he, he told Larry about me and he, he hired me. I asked, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny. I always have this connection with Larry and Teresa because I was on tour with them um, in 2015 and we were in Minneapolis and I got the call from, from Jenna that her water broke. Oh my god! And I had the emergency fly back to New York City and to, to Beth Israel and get and, and 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 be there for my child's birth. Of course. And then, um, so there's always like this kind of uh, <laughs> marking of time of you know when I see my son's now seven. I'm like, wow, right. that was seven years ago that we right did that, that I, gig. I, I, I was on the gig and I had to bail out. I I did. I was gone, only gone for three days and then I went went back and finished the tour. So, oh wow! Um, wow! But, wow! Um, Stellar people. Yeah, amazing fantastic. Yeah, yeah 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 no and i just they, played with them a, a couple of weeks ago at, at harley strictly which was which was fantastic yeah yeah they're getting ready to do quite a few shows too larry and Teresa. they were on a couple of weeks ago and uh yeah they've got a lot going on as well as well as you i mean um wow i look at the people that you've played with uh, it, brazilian girls how cool is that they're great yeah um Roseanne Cash. Yeah, I did a little stint with Roseanne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Trey Anastasio. Yes, I recorded on a. I play. It was. It was like a quintet. A, cla a you know. A, you know. A, a classical quintet. He writes a lot of. You know. 
you know, traditional music yeah. as well. So yeah, um, yeah, he absolutely does. Yeah, which is really really cool. Um, so when you noodle around at home, mm-hmm. do you do you do you just try to play his uh, not not try to play something, but are you always exploring? Are you still practicing? Are you st- yeah yeah huh? I'm always just improvising. I'm I'm I'm. Do you compose? I do compose, yeah, too, and I, 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 I don't have as much time to do to. I think one day, my the Jeff Hill record will come out. Uh huh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I hope but you I, come I, back. I, I'm, I'm an improviser at heart. I, lo- I love to improvise. And mm-hmm. In fact, when I was, when I was at Berkeley, I did spend a lot of time at, at NEC, um, playing with with. Uh, with some of the students I know it at New England Conservatory. New England Conservatory. Yes. Which yes. right down the street and I right. had a lot of friends there. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Saff, you probably know. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's been on the show. So Jamie and Kung Vu and and Bill McHenry and they were all friends of mine and they their lessons were so cool because they they would have a 2-hour lesson with George Garzon. Wow. And I and they would bring a rhythm section. Amazing. And, and then you just play free. Yeah. For two for like an hour and a half and then he'd stop and like wow. talk to everybody but but um so I did many of those lessons and and that was kind of a, more of a learning experience than anything I did at Berkeley. Right. But um Right. Right. Just Sometimes because, just getting into it. it yeah, cuz it was just like to to play free and just play and try to make music just by listening. A hundred percent. Was was so important and I didn't you don't get that really in a general ensemble. Where no. You, and 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 you know, and then you're playing with George, yeah. and so you're just like, okay. Oh my gosh! You know, yeah, that's, that's exciting. Oh my gosh! Yeah, no, a hundred percent. My daughter is um, a classically trained violinist oh, wow. who's graduating in six weeks from college, and now wants to do more of like expanding. You know, just because she's got that like classical thing, yeah, and yeah, you know, now rigidity, it's time yeah. to just improvise a little bit. And she was talking to John Medeski a couple of times, who also went to NEC. Yes. And now look at Medeski, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, all he yeah. does is improv. Yeah. And he was just encouraging her and mentoring her of just like, yeah, just don't be so. You, you got to get out of the headspace. Yeah. And, you know, and just like, yeah. And, and, and trust yourself. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, that's the thing with classical music, you know, that it's like note for note for note to yeah. where, okay, you can learn to play that really well, but now it's nicer just to do your own thing. So I find I hear her more just out of the box doing her thing and it is exciting it is exciting but i can totally understand um what you were saying um i was looking for the sheet of music that you gave me and do you have it over there oh yes i do you do oh my gosh because i'm leafing away i'm like what the (laughs) heck did i do with it so this is also cool 2021 latin grammy winner for best rock album how'd you get to be part of this vicentico Uh, Vicentico. Vicent, yes. Sorry, I don't he, do Spanish. He, um, my uh, good friend and 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 colleague uh, Hector Castillo was producing that record, and Tony Tony Mason and I played on that um, at a, a studio that I'm associated with in in, uh, in Long Island City called GB's Juke Joint. And um, so you know we recorded the record, and you know who knew Latin Grammy I winner. Get a Latin Grammy, it's great. Wow! It's now fantastic. you have a Grammy. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. They didn't give me one, but I guess I you have a great. You played on it. You <laughs> played on it. That's like amazing. Um, and you also, and I had Kenny Roby on here right before he released this new album. Oh, yeah. This is a great album. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you and Dan Littleton, who is beyond crazy good, yeah. um, and of course Tony Leone recorded right here in Woodstock at Applehead. Oh, that's a great album, yeah. Kenny Roby's new album. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to remember to play. Now, your partner, Ms. Jenna Kraus. Jenna Kraus, yeah. You guys recorded this with Hazy Malaise. We, so we recorded a Hazy Malaise song for the Neil Casal tribute record, The Highway Butterfly. Yeah, and that was during the pandemic. So that was that was uh, actually John Ginty's on it, and and uh, Marcus uh, uh, Marcus Marcus Randolph, who's Robert Randolph's cousin. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Who, who plays drums in his band also plays pedal steel and lap steel so he plays the lap steel on that which is fantastic oh my god good um, stuff good stuff shooter jennings i mean that's another neil connection as well shooter was moving to new york with 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 uh, 
Drea Mateo. She was here filming probably uh, something for a year. And uh, Neil, they lived, he was in LA and Neil was playing with Neil a lot. And Where did Neil live? In LA at that point. And so Shooter asked Neil, like, who do I call? You know, I'm going to New York. And she's like, call, call my buddy Jeff Hill. And then it turned out that you know, he, he called up and it turned out that my good buddy, Eric Deutsch, who I lived in the same building with in, in a loft space and, in, in, um, and he was, he went to elementary school with shoot. <laughs> so, so we ended up having this big party and then we brainstormed a record and we said, well, let's get John Grayboff, let's get Tony Leone, let's get the Mastersons. And then that was it. That was the record. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. It's, it's a beautiful career for you that is happening right now. So yeah. you've done a lot. You've got a lot more to go because you're young and um, you got a lot more to do. What's going on with you now? What are you doing? Well, I just got off the road uh, with Steve. And that was a long tour. It was long. It was uh, 14 weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks and now I'm pretty, I got pretty much nothing. Good. <laughs> nothing Chilling going on. I'm going to chill bit. out and, and, and uh, yeah. start thinking about what to do next. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Exciting stuff. Well, I'm going to play a couple more of these songs and when you get that Jeff Hill record out, um, I definitely want to have you back and, and we'll do this. Um, what track did we decide on? We wanted to do this. Uh, we could do that. That's, uh, or we could do, we could do the Neil, we could do something off the, we could do the uh, the tribute song. That would be a great one. Okay, that's with the with Jenna. Yeah. What a voice. Yeah, she's great. She actually sang on a um, with Blind Melon. Really? She's I, on a track called Mouthful of Cavities. Get out! I did not Blind know Melon that. Back in the, back in the nineties, I believe she did that. Yeah. Wow. So she's 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 a great singer. Yeah, yeah, she really is. I hope you have her on your Jeff Hill record. Oh, she will be on it. Yeah. I'll, I'll be on her record, too. Yeah. Oh, that's we're, awesome. We're, we're working on it. We're almost done. So. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, yeah, nice. Highway Butterfly, the songs of Neil Cassell. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know what? You guys are doing the right thing with this foundation, and um, getting it out there is what we need to do as humans, you know? And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So, Jeff, you have a great website, by the way, jeffhill.com. Mm -hmm. Jeff Hill, uh, no, Jeff, Jeff Hill, Hill Music. Mus is it Jeff Hill Music? Yeah. I, I think <laughs> it's... Or is it Jeff Hill Bass? I can't remember. Jeff Hill. Oh, my gosh. I should have written it down. I don't know that I did. But we can, you can, people can Google Jeff it Hill Bassist, and then it comes up. You also have social media pages, of course. And... Um, it's jeffhillbass.com. Jeffhillbass.com. Perfect. Thank you. Jeff Hill Bass. Yeah, because Jeff Hill is like, you know. Pretty common. It's a pretty common name. So you kind of have to differentiate that a little bit. All right. So we're going to take a listen to this. Tell me again what this is with the uh, Hazy. This is called uh, Soul Gets Lost. It's uh, it's by Hazy Millais. Perfect. Um, and it's on the Neil Casal tribute album called Highway Butterfly. JeffHillBass.com. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rita. It's been a pleasure. Read is my sister's name, too. So is it really? Name, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Um, Lenny White was on last week, and he said that that was his mother's name, too. We, well, you never hear this name. so Yeah, um, not, not these days. Not no, so much, yeah. it's it's uh, very unusual. So thank you for your time. And most of all, thank you for coming into the studio, because like I told you, so many people, it, because of the pandemic, it's been on the phone, and you know we've had some phone issues here last week. So it's really nice to have a human sitting across the record from me the record player so all right let's take a listen to some music here on 91.3 wvkr
3 WVKR Independent Radio Poughkeepsie New York. Oh, oh, so what did we just hear cuz I still have Jeff with me and um we just heard Steve Earl. Tell me about that one. Um that was part of uh the the Justin Towns Earl tribute record that we did during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And that's one of uh, Justin's songs. That's beautiful. And then we heard Jenna Krause with Hazy Malaise for the Neil Casal tribute album, Highway Butterfly. By the way, check that out, folks. It's a really amazing album, and you're benefiting an um, organization, a nonprofit organization that's um, doing really good work, neilcasalfoundation.org. Check it out. And a huge thank you again to Jeff, um, because it's been a lot of fun. And I tell you, I don't, I I was telling Jeff, I don't get a lot of in-studio guests, so I can't tell you the treat that it is to have somebody here. And I'm going to ask you to help me start my second hour here. Um, So you are tuned into Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York, broadcasting live from the campus of Vassar College. Every hour that I have a show where I don't have a guest, I start paying tribute to Tony Falco. And I, he left us uh, October 28th of 2021, and he left a lot of things. Um, most importantly, a beautiful family. His son, Lee, carries on with the Falcon. And if there's any way you ever want to think about how to honor Tony, go to a show at the Falcon, because that will do it. And um, Tony also left us with a playlist, a Spotify playlist. And I go down every week and I get a track and today's track and I do this in order and it's just freaky how it works out sometimes. But Leslie Mendelssohn today is who I'm going to play. Any memories that you want to share um, of Tony Falco? Of Tony? Well, I mean, I've, I played there several times. Actually, I played, played there for, with um, Jim Campolongo a few times. Oh, really? I played, you played with him too? Yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. I played there with, uh, with Blue Chicken. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you were that. You uh, might have been. At oh that my show. god, a hundred times. Oh, yeah, Blue yeah. Chicken with Jim Weeder. And I played there with Pound Cake. My band was Teddy Thompson. Oh and, my gosh. And I uh, and he loved Pound Cake. He was always trying to get get us to get us to play. And um, I just I just love how how um, he really championed musicians and he and and he made sure that we got paid even if even if it was a lighthouse, he would throw in some bucks. Yeah, he did. He was uh, he was just a, a special. Yeah, the um, uh, the motto is support living artists, and he most definitely did that. He has Absolutely. visual art up there the whole time, and um, what he did for live music in the Hudson Valley. What I first um, met him was right after he opened up the Falcon. Um, I think it was 2009 or 2010 when he moved it out of his house to the, yeah. the where it is now, and I um, I was blown away by the fact that he opens the doors to anyone, that there's no ticket ever sold at the Falcon, 
and that it's by donation. And the caliber of musicians that he gets there is amazing. Um, so whether you can afford to put $5 in that donation box, if times are hard, he would yeah. say, put whatever you can in. If times are good, hey, 30, 40, 50, be generous, throw 100 in. And people did it. Yeah. And they still do it. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you travel, you're touring a musician, you don't see that no, a- no. anywhere. You just don't. It is a very special place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to start off and, um, and in two weeks, uh, when it, we mark the one year, I'm going to do more. I don't know. I'll figure it all out as it gets closer, but, um, yeah, let's all remember Tony. And this was on his playlist, Leslie Mendelssohn, the album called Swan Feathers. And it's the track. I know you better than that. Let's take a listen and think of good thoughts with Tony Falco here on 91.3 WVKR. Today, I raise the clock for time Losing up both of my hands To find some peace of mind Everybody talking that is noising up my ear I'm trying to nullify the fear side Put my mind in the clear When the rain begin to fall Clouding thunder and all Screaming voices through the lightning Loud enough to make me fall I got the devil Get there, uplift up, spirit, talk to me, I hear it on the fly. I'll blow my suffering pain. 
to sell me daylight Fear it was a price to pay For me to not take flight Early in the London night scene I woke up in a song And then the day's affair Was in the air Where I know I did belong Ah, silver sand with the raising hand I was trying to out the light So it goes The truth be told My condition was of time My name is Bernard Purdy, better known as Bernard Pretty Purdy, and this is my record. Yeah. The skies filled with stars, the ocean was soft. Night full of dreamers, and I'll feel the fall. Thought you should know you fill up my thoughts See, I like you, I miss you, that's all She cries for the hate There's a boy full of love Who lives inside me He's searching to find What it is that he needs He's honest and brave And also afraid So much to give But not one to take The skies filled with stars The ocean with salt Dreamers, and I'm filled with fault. I thought you should know you fill up my thoughts. See, I like you, I miss you, that's all. I'm 
song And I'm full of dreamers And I'm filled with falls I thought you should know You fill up my thoughts See, I like you I miss you That's all WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. The incredibly talented K.J. Dennert off her release One Day. And K.J. is going to be playing at Terrytown Music Hall. They are doing a songwriter series there this Sunday. And let me get my info here so I can tell you exactly what's going on. So at Terrytown Music Hall this Sunday, October 16th. Oh, wait a minute. That happened already. Dear Lord, never mind. Never mind. Today's the 19th. Anyway, they just played 
singer-songwriter showcase featuring K.J. Dennert. That was this past Sunday at Terrytown Music Hall. And also included in there was the person we heard prior to that, Dan Zlotnick, with his album called Ballet of Dreamers. And we heard, no, the album called Bumpers, Ballet of Dreamers was the track we heard. Sorry, my guest just left, so I'm just getting my grips together here on air. So thanks for patiently waiting for me here. So we heard KJ Dennert and we had Dan Zlatnik, both of whom performed at the Terrytown Music Hall Singer Songwriter Showcase this past Sunday. We also heard music from Bernard Purdy and Friends, the album Cool Down and the track Elevate. Bernard Purdy will be making two appearances, the world famous drummer, one of the most recorded drummers, if not the most recorded drummer in recorded history, will be making two appearances this weekend at the Falcon. He'll be with Fred Thomas of the JBs with guest Bernard Purdy on Friday night. And then Bernard Purdy and Friends will be performing at the Falcon on Saturday night. So two opportunities to see the legendary Bernard Purdy at the Falcon in Marlboro. Never a ticket sold. Just make your reservation at liveatthefalcon.com or give them a call. Always a great lineup. And we started the segment off with a track from Leslie Mendelson off her album Swan Feathers the track called I Know You Better Than That. And that was taken from Tony Falco's playlist. And I start each and every show here when I don't have a guest with paying tribute to Tony, who passed away October 28th of 2021. And he left many things, including a really cool Spotify playlist. So I grab a track off of that every week and um, pay a little tribute to him. And stay tuned for next week when we'll do a little something special as well. And now... Let's start this little segment off with, again, first of all, a huge thank you to Jeff Hill for being my guest today. Um, Lovely gentleman and so much fun. We'll be playing more music at the end of the show that he's recorded on. So stay tuned for that. Right now, we'll take a listen to The Big Takeover, and they'll be playing at Bearsville in Woodstock October 29th. Let's take a listen to them right here, right now on 91.3. WVKR. We're back with the Greg Mulvaney Show. Thank you to our sponsors. I'm Greg Lee Mulvaney. And this is my wonderful sidekick, who is done playing! (laughs) Hello, I am Salvador Davies. Welcome back. We have a wonderful installment of music for you today, all the way from America, a band who is really pulling out all the stops to get you on the go. What Gregory is trying to say is that this is the biggest, best, brilliant, beatnik, booty-shaking band ever to come to our country. And without further ado, the big takeover! 